From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. Our pal Noel is on an adventure. They call me Ben. We're joined, as always, with our super producer, Paul Mission Control Deckett. Most importantly, you are you. You are here. That makes this the stuff they don't want you to know. And I was thinking, a good way to open the conversation this evening. Not everybody likes to hear this, but folks, fellow conspiracy realists, if you are listening tonight... You can thank drugs. We're not saying everybody's tuning in because they're under the influence of something at this moment. Uh, Matt, I was just, I was thinking through this. At some point in every human's personal history, a drug of some sort has saved your life or the lives of your ancestors, the people who came before, you know, penicillin, chemotherapy, even insulin treatments, right? In the modern day, drugs have saved countless lives. Oh, for sure. Um, even potentially something as innocuous as aspirin, or maybe you feel as though a drug has saved your life when you've taken a pain pill because you've been in excruciating pain and couldn't mentally handle it, you felt, but this magic little medicine, this drug, uh, got you through something. And one of the weird things with these drugs is that you are prescribed very specific doses of them when you've taken them and potentially when they've saved your lives, even something like, you know, an antibiotic. Mm -hmm. But if you overtake any one of these drugs, there are potential very, very bad effects. Mm -hmm. Here are the facts. Uh, I don't know if it's this way in every language, but in English, the word drug has a pretty rough connotation nowadays. We associate it with the heartbreak of abuse and addiction. And when we hear the word drug, a lot of us, I think it's fair to say, uh, immediately think of illegal narcotics, opioids, crack cocaine, things like that. But the real definition of a drug is much simpler, so much so that it's kind of unhelpful. A drug is technically, quote, any chemical substance that affects the functioning of living things, and organisms. Okay, that sounds like a lot of stuff. So, yeah, at that point, it, we have to ask ourselves, if this is true, then what is not a drug by that <laughs> definition, right? Is Right? Yeah, I mean, any sugar potentially falls into that. Uh, gosh, I guess even, I guess even sodium. Yeah, I mean, sodium is a chemical substance. I mean, drug use is also one of the oldest of all human technologies. I remember years ago, we got, we both got super into the theory that uh, early humans ingesting hallucinogens may have led to the creation of religion or the breaking of the bicameral mind. Yeah. The, the evolution of the thought process that we associate with humans mm -hmm. uh, may have had something to do with weird neurological connections that were made or, you know, remade or broken apart and reconnected because of psychotropic drug use. <laughs> so cool. So cool. Maybe, Can't really maybe. prove it. Yeah. Can't prove it yet. But what what a cool Uber conspiracy. We know we can prove that well before the invention of the written word, humans around the world knew some substances had beneficial effects and some had harmful effects. Which leads us to the question people still ask today, what then is the difference between a good drug and a bad one? It's a confusing question. You pointed out earlier so astutely, man, that these even the most innocuous substances can be dangerous or deadly in high enough doses or depending upon how they interact with mm -hmm. other substances, which is why you get weird warnings about when you should or should not consume things like grapefruits. <laughs> That's it's the thing my parents are dealing with right now. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, great. Grapefruits, man. Who would have thought? It's my, the least favorite fruit for me. Oh, I can understand why, I think. Uh, there, are, there are specific species of the grapefruit that are pretty wonderful. Or, uh, you know, versions of the grapefruit that are a little sweeter, less uh, 
<laughs> noxious to the old taste buds. Uh, yeah, I'll come clean with you. The the reason, and lest I seem to uh, cast dispersion on all grapefruit enthusiasts, do as you will. The reason for me is probably due to a um, a situation where I was stuck out in this camping compound for several weeks, and we were slowly running out of food and beverages. And the last thing left that was not water was grapefruit juice that had clearly gone bad, in my oh. opinion. And I, it was my first time drinking grapefruit juice. Absolutely ruined it for me. I thought, this is what this thing is supposed to taste like. And I mean, it tastes like that, bro. That's what it tastes like. That's what it tastes like? <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. I was in a situation where my grandparents would, uh, a set of my grandparents would constantly cut open a grapefruit. And then ha each of them have a half in a bowl in the morning. Yeah. And it wasn't the fun kinds of grapefruit. It was just a grapefruit. And dang, <laughs> it was just, whew. It wasn't one of the red ones or the. Yeah, the ruby <laughs> ones. Pretty good. That's it. Yeah. Well, this, this idea, right, as complicated as we can already tell it is, uh, it arrives because drugs, again, like any other technology, they have the same pitfalls. Right. A fire can burn a house as easily as it can warm a house. But in this case, with drugs, the house is you, folks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's very, very, very true. And I think maybe this specific point is, uh, let's say, a learning, a, a lesson that was learned by militaries, governments, people who want to be in control. Uh, also learned by hunters mm -hmm. early, early, early on. Uh, that you can use a substance that might be good for you in certain respects or at certain times or in certain dosages, uh, but it can also be deadly to an enemy or something you're trying to eventually eat. And the weirdest part is all across human civilization, in most cases, we still don't know which use humans figured out first. They say, <laughs> oh, this poison is actually a medicine or, oh, whoops, this medicine can be also be a poison. I want to. I want to. I want to believe. Let's say that it was medicinal first, like er, right, some kind of herbs that were discovered to, or just through testing and experimentation and word of mouth, try this specific herb concoction, and it will actually help your stomach if it's hurting really badly. But if you take too much of it and apply it to an arrowhead, you're going to make whatever you know, deer or you know, bison that you're hunting, it will go down way faster. Mm -hmm. And you'll, and importantly, you'll still be able to eat it. So yes. it will be contaminated, right? Uh, which you can't say for all, all substances. I, I also, I'm with you, Ben. I kind of like to think there is some relationship between the belief in sympathetic magic mm. there because someone, perhaps someone got sick uh, or they got cut by something and a substance entered their bloodstream and someone said, let's go back to the, you know, the scene of the crime or the accident and said, well, let's try a different version of the thing that cut you, you know, because mm. you're going to die anyway. Uh, there's a lot of trial and error is what we're saying. And there's still there's still a lot of errors today. Uh, recently, a collaboration that you and I did with the folks over at Lava for Good, uh, a panel about the war on drugs in the U.S. and abroad, uh, which is now up for a Webby. Everybody, please go vote. It'll be the first time we, we've gotten a Webby for something we were on air for. Is that correct? Maybe. Oh, well, I don't know. Uh, 13 Days of Halloween, I believe, won a Webby. Oh. Which mean, and I think it was one of the seasons, it was definitely a season that you wrote on. It was definitely a season that I executive produced on. So, no, we have, well, but I was not on mic. So well, I congrat might congratulations not to you, maybe Mike, either. Well, semi congratulations <laughs> to both of us and also with you uh, Do check out, <laughs> do check out 13 days. As you can tell, uh, Matt and I really, really love the work that goes into that. And it, it makes our day whatever people get to experience it for the first time. But with the social effects of drug use, right? I love that you laid out. Any kind of controlling authoritative structure has struggled with this. Religions, governments, you name it, your favorite cult leader. Uh, they have these policies around drug use, meaning there are social effects. So if you live in the U.S., whether or not you indulge in cannabis, 
You know, millions of people get locked away for nonviolent drug crimes. It ruins their lives. It sets them on a cycle of recidivism that gets increasingly difficult to escape and increasingly expensive to survive within. And then, you know, that's still better sadly, than places in the Middle East and Southeast Asia in particular, where a comparatively minor amount of certain narcotics can lead to a death sentence, and your home government cannot save you. Hear us well, Americans. Your home government cannot save you if a country has a death penalty for drug possession. And you get caught with it? Yeah. Don't. Don't, don't do it. If you feel like you have to have your drugs in that case, stay home. Go somewhere else. Also, don't carry around large sums of cash with you, especially if you're going to an airport, uh, especially one in Atlanta. Yes. Oh, nice. Yeah. Shout out to Clayton English and Eric Andre. Uh, Check out that panel, folks. Uh, There's also just a side note here. uh, There's also something a lot of people don't understand. If a foreign government that has really draconian drug policies wants to get you for possession, they can drug test you. And having a substance in your hair or your bloodstream or your body will for them count as possession. Oh. Yeah. If it is in you, I suppose you do possess it. Yeah. I don't know. It it depends on, really, it depends on what they want to do with you. Well, it's more like it's possessing you, right? Nah. Yeah. It depends on the substance, right? (laughs) And this... This gets us to, these are all true chilling conspiracies, but it leads us to another side of the story, a disturbing aspect of drugs and humans that we briefly discussed, but haven't really explored fully. It's this, what happens when people purposely decide to use drugs as weapons? We're going to pause for a word from our sponsors. We'll be right back. We've returned. Here's where it gets crazy. Man, man, we were just comparing notes before we went on air, Matt. And uh, I think we both, yet again, we both got super into the same two big topics. And they're, I don't know, man, I'm bothered. <laughs> I I don't think it's bothersome. I think this is exactly the kind of thing this topic needs us to discuss. Like uh, some specific examples of when drugs were used as weapons, right? Mm -hmm. But that are not the, let's say, traditional chemical weapons we might think of, right? Like especially chemical weapons that are associated with World War I, mustard gas, uh, some of the stuff that was developed by the Nazis, some by, you know, British and American forces, um, but chemical weapons that were meant to be dropped often from above and meant to incapacitate or kill enemy combatants down below. Uh, we're talking more, when is a more medicinal drug that we would think about, when is that used or has it been used as a weapon? Yeah, and that's an important distinction. We know we know chemical warfare or drugs as weapons uh, we do associate it with World War I these days with nerve gas and uh, later with VX and stuff like that. But but again, it goes back to the ancient past. In eight, 184 BCE, Hannibal's army used Belladonna to disorient enemy forces. I, and I what, didn't, what, what is Belladonna? Belladonna is one of the – okay, so there's like a Wu-Tang clan of these plants. That, that uh, have okay. these drugs. Uh, I thought you were going to say there's a member of Wu-Tang called Belladonna that I've <laughs> never heard of. And I was like, I would I totally, don't think so. <laughs> I would totally tune in. I'll hear it out. It's, uh, uh, it's from the Nightshade family. Okay. Okay. And a lot of these things that we're going to explore originate from the Nightshade family. Uh, it's, if you look at it, it's like an herb. It's a, bu- it's a bush, basically. Uh, and you can find it throughout Central and South Eurasia. It gets pretty tall. Um, it is toxic. Its other name is Deadly Nightshade. Oh. To differentiate it from the rest of the good folks at the Nightshade family. And and you said Hannibal, way back then, used it as not as a maybe lethal uh, technique, dosing technique, but as a disorienting thing. <laughs> Yes, and to be clear, Hannibal would have been fine if that disorientation led to death. 
Sure. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> but, but in this case, it's more like um, make my troops advancement uh, more effective by disabling your troops a little bit. Mm, like a flashbang, mm, right, mm. in some ways. And then I didn't know this, but uh, there's this author, David A. Price, who has a book called Love and Hate in Jamestown. And in this book, uh, which I haven't finished, uh, in this book, he makes a pretty fascinating case. He says that. Chief Powhatan had deployed a toxic hallucinogen against the Jamestown colony in 1611, which I had not heard before. Was it uh, bread? Was it was it that ergot? Ergot? (laughs) (laughs) I don't know, man. I don't know this. uh, But this this is just these are two examples from across centuries and continents. Uh, We also I think you and I were both very taken with an article about this conundrum uh, by a scholar named uh, Vladimir Pitchman uh, and his co-author's name. Yes, the co-author's, uh, well, the co-author is uh, Z-D-E-N-E-K, mm-hmm. Zdenik uh, Han, and there's also an academic editor that worked on this paper, Mirta Milic. Mm-hmm. And this paper is fascinating. It's called Drugs as Chemical Weapons, Past and Perspectives. You can read it in full online for free today. Uh, they they make this case where they say, look, the sources of pretty much any poison that's been deployed by the, the criminals or state powers, they've also always been natural agents that serve as medicines. And then he says, you know, originally uh, the most militarily significant toxins they were discovered as a byproduct of pharmaceutical research most for most of history. It wasn't until pretty recently that government started saying, let's make bad stuff on purpose. Yeah, let's have an R&D department that specifically tries to figure out the most toxic, dangerous chemicals or just natural substances that we can then synthesize with a new thing that's exactly the same chemical combination or we can concentrate and combine to make something that just makes you dead. Yeah, drugs are a dual-use technology, now that we think about it, aren't they? I, and, then, and then, of course, that, there's that lovely, lovely phase that so many governments went through several decades back, where they would find nifty, unfamiliar substances and then say, hey, what, what does this do? Let's just, you know, let's F-A-F-O. Yeah, but what it do, though? You know what, what I mean? What what <laughs> it do? Uh, it shout out to MK Ultra. Shout out to the CIA's weird phase with LSD when they were literally just dosing the snot out of each other. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, hey, let's just we can't recommend this article enough because there's a huge list that Ben and I were discussing off air that it shows what we were talking about early on here. Um, arrowhead toxins that were also used as for medicinal purposes by indigenous groups across the world. Uh, it is really great. Like it's really great and worth your time. Uh, we decided that we cannot pronounce effectively most of the words that are, I, mean, I decided, I decided that I can't pronounce. <laughs> we can make an attempt, but we're not going to nail a lot of these because we are not chemists. But yes, but do look it up because it's, it's very fascinating and it goes across. Um, I think it's every continent that it hits where, here is a series of medicinal herbs that were also used as offensive weapons. Yeah. And here's the good thing that people learn to do with mm-hmm. this stuff, like treat skin problems mm-hmm. or fungal infections. And then they found out they could also poison animals and people. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, also, you know, if we fast forward to the modern day, Uh, There's one story that we have to share that captivated both of us because we were saying, you know, to that earlier distinction you made, we were saying, let's find a case where someone took not like a, not mustard gas, not a nerve agent, but what you would consider a quote unquote regular drug. And let's see when they used it offensively on purpose in the modern day. That takes us to Russia in October of 2002 at the Moscow Ball Bearing Plants Palace of Culture. It's also known as the Dubrovka Theater in Moscow. And this is uh, 
Well, there was something that was showing that night, according to the BBC. I'm just, I'm just going to cite this article, Ben, so people can find it if they want to. Uh, there's a BBC article from October 24th, 2012, titled Moscow Theater Siege, Questions Remain Unanswered, which is written 10 years after this thing that we're talking about that happened in 2002. Um, and it it gives us a little bit of context. But what we need to know is that there's a, there is a show going on, a, a musical going on at this huge theater in Moscow when it is stormed by uh, a bunch of people. Yeah. So uh, later results would find that 912 people or so were in the audience and they were watching that musical you're describing, Nord Ost. And uh, I think they're just moving. They're relatively early into the show. I think they're in the second act, maybe. And these terrorists, male and female, uh, identified members of the Chechen army. Uh, some of them have explosives strapped to their body and they have one demand. And it is the typical demand of Chechen separatist groups, uh, or as Russia would call them, Chechen separatist groups. They say, Russia, withdraw all of your military forces immediately, all of your state forces, free Chechnya. And this was a common demand, this withdrawal, because Russian forces had been occupying Chechnya, had left, had come back. And for 57 hours, it was a brutal standoff. We know that two of the hostages died sometime in that 57 hours, but the Russian authorities were at a loss. They had the place surrounded. These terrorists were not going to make it out one way or no. the other. Well, and there, let's really say there were there were at least 40 militants yes. or, or yeah. you know, people who were in there as the hostage takers who were controlling the 912 people who were hostages. Uh, so if you just imagine a huge theater, that number of people, and then think about strategies of going in and stopping the situation, if you're going to do it by force, yeah. right? You yeah. Know, I, I imagine uh, those Russian forces strategizing and, you know, a room of people trying to come up with the best way. And what did they come up with? <sighs> they came up with what you might call a very Russian solution to the problem right if they attempt to breach this facility occupied by a small like basically a militia uh they would lose most people before before they could rescue hostages so their solution is novel it's innovative it is incredibly ruthless they pump what is first described as an unknown gas into the building and they pump a lot of it in Nearly all of the terrorists and hostages fall unconscious immediately or die. Yeah. And well, at least according to BBC News and uh, people reporting on it at the time, there was no warning given to anybody that this gas, this substance, whatever it was, was going to be deployed. Inclu they didn't even warn like the, some of the first responders that were immediately outside of the facility. Mm hmm. So and it was leaking outside of the facility and affecting people that were nearby. Yeah, you're just some guy at, you know, the sandwich shop next door. Well, yeah, or a, or a fireman or, mm -hmm. you know, just a first some, responder. Exactly. Yeah. Who's outside and there's some kind of weird smoke looking stuff coming out of like some of the ventilation or the side of the building and it's affecting you. Um, and how did they describe it? At the time after they, they, cause they acknowledged it like hours and hours later that they released some kind of gas. Yeah. Yeah. You're saying how did the international news or how well, did, how the, did, how did the Russian authorities acknowledge that they even gassed people? Oh, oh, do you have the quote? I think BBC has this one. Well, according to this BBC news article by Artem Krachetnikov, um, he is saying that public health services were not warned in advance that this type of, uh, um, I don't know, measure would be used, releasing a gas into this huge building. Uh, police did not clear the nearby streets of any parked ve vehicles. Ambulances arrived on the scene an hour and a half after the operation began. And again, this gas was still, it wasn't being dispersed actively, but it was still dispersing out of the uh, building. Yeah, the phrase they would use is an aerosol anesthetic uh, later when they explain this. But for a lot of the surviving hostages, we see that they originally thought there was smoke from a fire 
somewhere yes, else. Yes. Because it was pumped through the AC system. And then the authorities, I found it, Ben, the authorities didn't acknowledge it until eight hours later that they even did that. And as, oh, oh okay, we'll, we'll see why that was sort yeah. of a dick move. So, oh, and they didn't say what gas it was. And they did not say what <laughs> gas it was. Uh, later, the Russian health minister, Yuri uh, Shevchenko, would say that this gas is based on fentanyl. Uh, what this means is that the gas was later found to contain carfentanyl, an opioid 10,000 times more powerful than morphine, about a hundred times more powerful than fentanyl, which is already very scary yep. stuff. It's ripping through various parts of the world like a natural disaster. But I guess we should also point out, you know, we're talking about this off air. Do we still have to smack in allegedly on this one? Um, I guess we probably should. There have been some court cases associated with this because 130 hostages died during yeah. this operation. 130 Ooh. of those 912 um, many of them died at the hands of, you know, allegedly the hostage takers, at least according to the reports. But some of them died from the effects of the gas. Some of them pretty soon after it was released and others days after it was released. Oh, yeah. Here's a terrifying quote from an author named David Satter in his book, The Less You Know, The Better You Sleep. He studies Russia extensively for the Hudson Institution. Or Can we just say that quote is amazing? The less you know, the better you sleep. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's not even the full title of the book. But yeah, but we went with the banger part. Uh, so here's the quote. Here's a quote from Satter's book. It talks about how when after the breach, after the authorities deployed the gas and breached the theater, they just started dragging folks out and they did not discriminate between the hostages and the terrorists or excuse me, the hostage takers nor the living and the dead. They just piled them all up like firewood in buses and cars. And Satter says they were uh, bodies were piled on top of another, each other outside the theater entrance. No attempt to separate the living from the dead. A well-known songwriter died after spending seven hours alive in a bus packed with corpses. Golly. Yeah. A 13 year old girl was also crushed beneath a, uh, a mass of hostages in a, in a minibus died on the way to the hospital. Jeez. Well, let's talk about why this is so um, messed up Why the tactic itself was messed up to just release gas at whatever uh, concentration it was at into a massive area with a huge group of people, because no matter what that substance was, whether it was carfentanil or uh, you know, some other fentanyl derivative or some other sleeping gas, as they called it, um, you are dosing everybody with the same amount, right? And as we know, when you go to the doctor and you get prescribed a medicine of any kind, they look at your weight, right? Your height, your sometimes your BMI, which is a flawed thing anyway, but, you know, your body mass index. Other medications you might be taking. Yes. Uh, your age, right? The Everything goes into account for how much of a certain medicine you are supposed to be uh, getting, what dosage. In this case, they dosed everybody with the same amount with the hope of disabling like grown men with Kalashnikovs. Right. And suicide bombers. Yes. So they're going, you got to think they're going for an OD effect. Yes. Yeah. And then there is some brutal calculus that we can unfortunately understand, right? We don't have to agree with what they did, but we can understand where they were coming from because it was, from their perspective, it was a, at least in the official narrative, they were saying, look, we can try traditional methods and lose all of them and probably quite a few of our own officers or we can try to save some knowing that some of these hostages will die you know because again it's almost a thousand people yeah we're gonna save some people that's the thought right well if that was the thought however and we could even we could make an entire episode about this theater situation because there's a lot going on under the surface but if that was indeed their thought then why did they refuse to reveal what they had dosed the theater with? Because in those eight hours, it took them to reveal 
the actual ingredients of the drug they weaponized, doctors were losing patients in the hospital because you have to know what happened to someone to treat them. So they're scrambling and we cannot praise these doctors highly enough. They're in a terrible situation. It's a ticking time bomb and they're going through one antidote or treatment or cure after another. They finally scramble on, I think it was uh, Noxalone. Oh yeah. Like the stuff that you save someone who is overdosing on an opioid. Right. Yes. Yeah. That stuff. And all of the hostage takers did die. 130 or so of the hostages died. And most of the hostages who died was a result of um, the terrorism or the hostage takers. It was a result of the gas that the Russian government deployed. Yeah. We don't know the exact details, which is a problem, right? Again, this has gone to trial. There's been examinations of this, like what happened there with some conclusions that feel more concrete than others. Um, But definitely the 40 people, well, let's say 39 of the people that were hostage takers were killed either by being shot after being disabled or whatever. But there was one guy who ended up having to stand trial for this. Literally one human being out of the 40. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Made it out alive that had to stand trial. Um, but then the, you know, the rest of the families of the other people, specifically the 130 that died were left with so many questions trying to figure out what the heck happened. And what do you do now? Like, what do we do now? Yeah. Um, what about when Litvang, Litvinenko said later that some of these hostage takers or Chechen militants were working for the FSB, you know? See, yeah, well, I, 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 we don't want to focus too much on this, but how yeah. did the Chechen rebels get into Moscow with <sighs> 100 kilograms of explosives, mm-hmm. 100 hand grenades, mm-hmm. three what they call heavy bombs, and 18 AK assault rifles, uh, and 20 pistols, by the way. But how did they get into the country and through all the checkpoints and into the heart of Moscow to take, like, to make this attack happen? And how, okay, and also what about the signals that the Chechens were sending out pretty blatantly in the months leading. Okay. You're right. You're right. We'll have to do an episode <laughs> because otherwise we're just, okay. All right. Maybe Matt, what about this? Should we take an ad break and get to another drug as a weapon? Uh, yeah, please. <laughs> And we have returned. Uh, I believe this is what originally inspired uh, this episode this evening. Uh, Matt, on a previous strange news, uh, you had shared an intensely disturbing story of criminals operating in the Atlanta area and drugging um, partygoers with something. Mm. Yeah. Uh, gosh, it it. It's unknown right now what drug was used in these specific Atlanta attacks. There were also attacks in New York City that were very, very similar Right. um, with substances. Whatever the substance is, it was uh, it was used to make someone seem extremely intoxicated and lose consciousness at some point or to some extent and also become extremely. What word would you use? Suggestible, compliant. That's it. That's what it is. Just going along with things like everything's okay, but not having all of your faculties anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And this prompted a conversation that we've had with many of our fellow conspiracy realists uh, via email, um, via the various ways you can contact us, like our our call in line. And a lot of us were bringing up a substance made from the Torah seeds, also derived from the nightshade family called scopolamine. Uh, S-C-O-P-O-L-A-M-I-N-E. It is way more fun to sound out that word than it is to take that substance. Uh, yeah, it's called the most dangerous drug in the world. Uh, <laughs> yeah. it, it, and it's also used, it's called uh, in other places, the zombie drug. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, oh, there's, Devil's breath. Yeah, it's got all kinds of words, Espe- specifically because of the way it was deployed Gosh, where was that, Ben? We heard about it being deployed in several countries where it was made into a powder that was then blown into somebody's face. Yeah, Colombia was big for that. Um, parts of uh, other parts of the region, like Ecuador. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, but the 
substances like this can be derived from a lot of different forms of the nightshade mm. family. Uh, and you can find uh, scopolamine in things like mandrake, angel's trumpet, henbane, plants, to be honest, that I would not be able to readily identify in the wild. Yeah. But but the specific plant is Datura, right? That's the yes. one we had people writing to us after we had that discussion on Strange News, yeah. talking about Datura and uh, the seeds from that plant. Old Jimson weed is yeah. another name for it, which is way more innocuous. Jimson weed, Jimson weed sounds like a character in a Wild West story that we would make up. You know? Yeah, I like him if he's a little bit older. He's yeah. been around for a long time. Old Jimson Weed. He's got a slight quaver in his voice. <laughs> <laughs> He's seen it all, you know? <laughs> okay. We needed that levity. But yeah, maybe we should write that. Maybe we should use the character Jimson Weed. Into it. He's, he's, always, he's always vaguely surprised. <laughs> <laughs> he's got okay. a dog. <laughs> so, all right. Each of these plants, as Jimson can assure you, will have a long history in the spiritual practices of indigenous cultures around the world. Like they're not universally considered demonic, insidious, or bad. I was surprised to learn the name Datura comes from India because uh, the Datura metal, a related plant, is considered to be a sacred favorite plant of the god Shiva. Oh, cool. G Am I wrong? Isn't Shiva like the creator destroyer? Yeah, no, you're right. Okay, yeah, that's interesting. Isn't that interesting? Creator and destroyer. Hmm. Uh, yeah, the uh, I think Shiva is the destroyer oh, of okay. the Trinity. Oh, hmm. okay, cool. Woo! Uh, he, shout wait. out to CERN. <laughs> yes, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, no, you're right, because Shiva creates the universe but then is also the destroyer in the Trimurti, the, the Hindu trinity. Look, man, I'm just going off of these weird little impulses that are bouncing around in my brain of things I may have read once, uh, mm -hmm. and so I have no idea. I need to bone up on my Shiva. Dude, we should go to um, we should go to BAPS. Oh, I would it, love to go there. We should go do some stuff, talk to some people. Yeah, let's actually, let's make a day of it. Let's do mm -hmm. it. Um, we are very lucky here in the fair metropolis of Atlanta to have um, some, to have a collection of holy places, Watts, temples, and um, monasteries even. And Baps is a Hindu temple with quite a story behind it. And lest we sound, lest we sound like we're, you know, super fancy guys or something, Matt, the reason I want to go to the temple is I want to go back to the gift shop again because they have comic books about Shiva. Oh, cool. Yeah, they're really cool. Uh, that, and I, Temple's yeah. nice, too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, I, what's a good way for people to find it if you want to look it up? Just B-A-P-S Atlanta is probably the only search terms you need to be able to find this amazing place. Maybe BAPS Atlanta Hindu. There you go. Uh, just to be safe. But that'll lead you to BAPS Sri Swaminarayan Mandir. There so you the go. temples are called Mandos. It's in Lilburn, Georgia. So if you happen to have some time in Atlanta and you want to see something cool, then do check that out. Uh, like astounding and unexpected. Like yeah. when, when you behold it and you're like, wait, where am I? How did this? Why? Mm -hmm. What? <laughs> They've got a great vegetarian restaurant on the ground. All they ask is that you don't bring uh, meat or leather products in, into the grounds, which I think is very reasonable. But it's such a trip to find it because directly across the street, there's a subway. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank goodness there are at least sandwiches. I, I always remember that because pre-internet days, I was, I was attempting to find this um, for some unrelated research and meeting some folks, and I didn't have like GPS. Mm -hmm. So I, I stopped at a gas station and asked for directions, and the guy told me, well, you know where the subway is, right? And told me to just drive to the subway and take a left or something. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Check out, check this out. What you need to know from this conversation is that these drugs do, or these substances, these plants do again have a deep religious history, right? Um, medicine for the mind, you could say. But in the modern day, you're not going to hear a lot about that. You're going to much more often hear about, uh, 
the Torah and the Torah seeds and scopolamine being used in crime. And that's where like, that's where they have a little paper thing and they blow the dust in your face in Colombia, or also uh, lace it on a cigarette because it just takes a little bit of this stuff. Oh, that's really scary. Yeah, I uh, any any well, I guess it's true for so many drugs, but any drug or substance that you can just slip into something like that or dose, you know, uh, another thing that you're going to take in by the, either by inhaling or drinking, that that is just super freaky because it is somewhat or mostly invisible. Yeah, tasteless, odorless, and it's, and it's just a couple sniffs. Um and then the effects are severe. Uh, virtually immediate and to the unsuspecting bystander, the effects are invisible. Yikes. You're not, yeah. you know, you're not like Hunter S Thompson on ether in Vegas or something waving around like a, a cartoon inflatable guy at a car stri- shop, car shop. <laughs> yeah, no, you, you may just seem intoxicated. Right. And when this drug is applied to someone who is, let's say, in a bar or coming out of a bar right. or had just, you know, been having drinks or smoking a little whatever with some friends that it may appear completely normal and just the mild effects of whatever other substance they were, in, you know, taking. Yeah, but the criminals will know what what's going on beneath the surface and they have deployed this drug as a weapon because it makes people so incredibly suggestible to a zombie level of compliance. They can walk around on their own power, but if you say, hey, let's go to the ATM, put your card in the ATM, or give me your card and your PIN number, and then withdraw as much as you can, they'll say, oh, yeah, okay. Sure. Sure, let's do it. Uh, and Ben, you found an article here from globalpost.ca. Uh, why don't you tell us about that? Yeah, so we go to a, a toxicologist, an expert on this drug in particular, who points out several things. The effect can last for more than 24 hours. And uh, the in, if someone is somehow still not fully compliant, then the criminals may dose them again. And if you have a large enough dose of this drug, usually delivered in like a powder form, then you will experience respiratory failure and death. And this guy, Camilo Uribe, uh, this toxicologist, he says that scopolamine blocks neurotransmitters that carry information to the brain, the part of the brain that stores short term memory. So it like being blackout drunk, it doesn't record what a person has done or being really high, I guess. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that's why, you know, like you were saying, the you were saying, Ben, these, you know, I'm remembering these things because they're popping around in the neurons in my brain. Uh, Scopolamine stops a lot of that. And uh, there's a chilling quote from Camilo that we were able to confirm uh, this expert is describing things that actually happen. Oh, yeah. He says, quote, I can give you a gun and tell you to go kill someone and you will do it. Yikes. 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 Mm. See, now that mm, speaking of MK Ultra and some of these other, you know, experimentations and potential like, uh, let's say rumors about Manchurian candidate stuff. Uh, someone who is so susceptible that they will take a gun and they will. You know, when they're in that state or under the effects of a substance, they will need to want to and be totally fine with taking a gun and shooting someone. And then when they're not on that drug, they don't even remember having those thoughts. But then drug gets introduced again and then potentially uh, they're a killer. Which differentiates this from other states of suggestibility like a trance state or Mm -hmm. hypnosis. When people are in those sorts of states... They are suggestible, but they will not ordinarily do something they would otherwise not have done. You know what I mean? If they weren't going to kill someone while they were fully conscious, they're not going to do it when they're quote unquote hypnotized. But with this drug, anything is on the table. Yeah, this drug has actual brainwashing potential. And you might be saying, well, does that mean Manchurian candidates are real? Not quite because of the, the window of time, you know. A Manchurian candidate would need to function as a sleeper agent without their own knowledge for uh, much longer 
uh, than the effects of scopolamine can create. Well, I see, but okay, let's just, let's game it out for a second. Sure. Let's imagine that Sirhan Sirhan, the man who, you know, killed Robert Kennedy. Mm -hmm. um, Let's just say while he's there at that event, he, this stuff is blown into his face and he is given a gun and he is told you need to kill Robert Kennedy. You have to kill Robert Kennedy. Yeah. And because I see where you're going, because he doesn't have a memory yeah. of doing this. He comes to, however, um, that's, I, I would say that's like a, that's like a microwave Manchurian candidate, right? Or a <laughs> yeah. micro Manchurian because again of that time window, right? You could, um, in the Manchurian candidate story in the fiction, right? The idea is that you could have this effect buried for years and then trigger it. But what you're describing now, you pointed out, dude, that does sound possible, right? Sirhan, Sirhan episode. Let's do it. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I'm just throwing things out here, trying to make connections, but it, it, it is, um, it is weird thinking about that drug as the, the potential for that drug to be used in heinous ways by, let's say a military or an intelligence agency that wants to use it for offensive reasons. Right. Yeah. And again, when the effect wears off, it will be as though the victim is trying to recall a fading dream. A lot of, a lot of people experience that pretty commonly throughout the week. Uh, you will wake up with a vivid dream and you'll try to remember it. And then, you know, by the time 20 or 30 minutes have passed, you only remember these little tableaus, right? Bro, I'm pro. I had one last night where I woke up. I thought I woke up in my bed. Mm -hmm. took some actions Mm -hmm. and then uh something horrible happened and then i woke up in my bed again and i swear to you i was in my house awake for that that dream part it was just it was intense and and that's it's that kind of thing where um i don't know uh, this drug specifically blurs the line between reality and like you said kind of a dream state so mm-hmm. much that I feel like it's one of the most dangerous. It is one of the most dangerous things that exists on the planet. Yeah, because if reality is perception, it is altering your reality in a non-consensual way, right? And yep. and the it's even worse than you know some of those dreams uh, that we're we're talking about. Like Matt, it sounds like you two have experienced the thing where you have a dream where which that's so vivid and disturbing that you don't want to go back to sleep for a little bit. Oh yeah. I have it happens all the time. Yeah, yeah. Like, that's that's why I'll send it in an email at three thirty in the morning sometimes because I'm like, Haha, they're not going to get me this time. Back to work. <laughs> what was that book again? The less you know, the better you sleep. The less like you, there it is. There it is. Uh, and this is um, exposure to this substance is even worse because you will come to in a situation that is probably very unfamiliar to you. And if you think really hard, you might be able to retrieve from your memory banks flashes. Like you may, you may remember emptying your bank account or throwing a bunch of valuable things from your house into a bag. Or we even found one story guy wakes up, but his apartment's empty. And he vaguely remembers helping move all his crap out of his apartment into a van. What? Vaguely. Okay. <laughs> I feel like pizza and beer will do that sometimes to you, you know, like too much, too much, too much cheese and carbs and oh, yeah. uh, alcohol. <laughs> Man, I really don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you always take a picture of your moving crew yeah. before you start. So, uh, so there's this vice documentary that we talked about briefly as well uh, from 2012. It's excellent. This is the one that calls uh, this drug, the most dangerous drug in the world. And in Colombia, I think it's commonly derived from the Boracero tree, which is roughly translates to like, I think the drunken binge tree or something Ooh, like that. Wow. Yeah. And the, the people who are, making this documentary they're down there they're in colombia and they're speaking with drug dealers and also just regular colombian civilians who all confirm this stuff makes people childlike you can guide them wherever you want uh the u.s authorities think it uh, also wrote about this because it was seen as a big big problem it's just like what happens in other countries 
you're at a bar, you're at a club, you're having fun. Um, maybe an unfamiliar, attractive stranger finds you very interesting. You know what I mean? Who doesn't love a little affirmation in that regard? Even if you're, even if you're already in a relationship, a lot of people will just say like, oh, well, thank you. I <laughs> also find myself pretty interesting. And there's and- <laughs> also the scenario where there's an attractive person like that, that unbeknownst to you is making themselves known to you uh, without approaching you. So that you approach right. them, which is uh, in the exact same scenario. Just that one is even a little more insidious because it makes you think it's your idea. That I I would say yes, and I'm glad you point that out. But that also brings up some bigger issues because people who are doing that uh, and sort of um, implanting that idea or those actions in your head they're often professionals at yes. doing that kind of thing. Hey, a uh, quick plug. Listen to To Die For. It's another show from Tenderfoot TV. And uh, it is with the host, Neil Strauss, who made To Live and Die in L.A. And it talks, uh, it. the whole thing is about this uh, Russian, uh, alleged Russian sexpionage agent and using these types of tactics. That's what is got me thinking about that. Tactic. Shout out the sparrows. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The concept of black widow did not come up from thin air, Yeah, <laughs> but the, yeah. And, and look, it goes back to, you know, what we have described sometimes as the two ten rule, uh, honeypot operations are real. You don't have to be a diplomat, you know, uh, you don't have to be a professor doing some like edgy research or a business tycoon, you, you might can, just be hanging out at a bar in Atlanta. <laughs> yeah, you can ju- you can also just be you don't have to be a stranger in a strange land. This can happen in much many more places than you think. And folks, we are not saying this uh to disrespect anybody's self-esteem or your appearance or your riz or whatever. You just always need to be skeptical when an attractive person approaches you in an unfamiliar place, not even in attractive, not even in physical terms, like someone with that you want. Yes. Right? Specifically you specifically <laughs> yeah. you. Um, and well, this is what I would recommend to everybody. Just make sure you have zero riz when you're out and about uh, as I do, and you're good to go. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, one, of, one of my, I, I don't know if I ever told you this, but one of the best ways I cut off a conversation, um, I was, I was at a crosswalk in New York city and someone was really trying to talk to me about something. So I'm just waiting. And then eventually I turned to them cause it, you know, they're clearly targeting me, talking to me, turn to them. And then I say, just like this, I'm sorry, I don't speak English. Effective, was it? <laughs> I think it was just surreal enough because of the um, the American accent. Mm-hmm. It was just surreal enough. They were like, oh, okay, this guy is either a jerk, mental issues, either way, too complicated. Moving on to the next person. Yeah, nice, very nice. So tell us if that works for you. But <laughs> but uh, but what we're what we're seeing here is that. Uh, approximately 50,000 known incidents of drugging occurred uh, uh, like from 2012 on, like each year in Colombia, largely in the capital city. Uh, but Colombia, I think it's a short shrift in a lot of this reporting, because when we focus on Colombia, then we are forgetting that this substance de- is deployed around the world. It is a drug that has been weaponized, not just for street crime. I, we're going to maybe we go through some quick historical stories, Matt. I, I want to get to one of my um, my favorite ones from the 80s. But this it feels weird to call it a favorite. Oh, sure. Well, let's just continue with scopolamine there for a second, because we do know that it's been used as an interrogation additive. A little yeah, like uh, adjunctive, yeah. whatever yeah, 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 you want to yeah. call it. Sure. <laughs> just a little as a treat. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, but you can imagine when someone is super compliant and you are not, they are not holding back on all of those control mechanisms that would prevent them from revealing secret information, right? Or, you know, confessing to a crime and saying what they actually did. You can imagine it'd be very helpful. Um, and this was something that, what, what did you find here, Ben? Who was using it? Uh, yeah, the Czech secret police. 
back in the 1950s. In 2009, it was it was proven beyond the shadow of a doubt that they used scopolamine at least thrice to get confessions. So that means they used it much more often. The only wow. way we're able to confirm the three instances is because there's an eyewitness who was credible uh, in court in 2009. And uh, they weren't the first to do this. Yosef Mengele, the Nazi angel of death, used it in interrogations. People thought it was a truth serum because it made them more compliant. But it turns out the science was sort of trash because if people are very compliant, but they're also they've also lost the ability to differentiate fact from fiction, then whatever their confessions are, are just what you told them to say. Oh, boy. You asked them a question in a leading way, and they were like, I, yeah, I guess. Are you Elvis hmm. Presley? Now that I think about it. You know what? <laughs> uh, but, you know, it, it reminds me of our exploration on torture and the the results often that you get from torturing someone is what you want them to say. Exactly right. Uh, and that's that's a hard pill for a lot of people to swallow uh, because it leads us to an even more uncomfortable series of conspiracies. And OK, here is. Again, I, I hesitate to call it my favorite story, but this is so strange. So way back in the 1980s, there is a diplomat, Colombian diplomat, going to Chile. Happens all the time, right? This guy is caught smuggling cocaine into the country. Diplomat smuggling cocaine. Weird. Disaster from the jump. It's not a good look. You know, you're supposed to use diplomatic pouches for non-illegal things. Uh, so he was going under the jail, right, in many ways. But apparently authorities and doctors investigated him and determined that he was under the influence of scopolamine at the time. No way. That's so like the story. An unwilling diplomatic mule? An unwilling diplomatic drug mule, and he couldn't remember who got to him. So the charges against him were dropped. Now, this is a little bit weird because also if if you don't want to get in trouble for smuggling cocaine and you're aware of this drug, then maybe you could use that as a get out of jail free card on yourself, like hit yourself with it. Uh, oh, the cops. Oh. <laughs> I'm like, whoa, would that work? Oh, my God. What? what that's like a nuclear level strategy well yeah but instead of the you know false tooth that's got poison in it to take yourself out if you're an intelligence agent you've just got a scopolamine tooth take it out crack it and <gasps> this guy great we have to hold him for another 24 hours well right? yeah but they didn't see it so now you're like somebody scopolamined me <laughs> such a, like, can you imagine using <laughs> that in just any awkward situation right <laughs> Like your your significant other is mad at you or something. Oh, yeah. you didn't defrost the chicken? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, babe. I got scoplamine again. <laughs> <laughs> at least I still have my kidneys. Oh, I'm sorry. I know we're joking about this, but people have died from this stuff. People yeah. have been robbed and assaulted with this assaulted, stuff. So, kidnapped. Ass we're so sorry. I'm sorry for joking about it, but it is like, uh, yeah, it is no ridiculous. Excuse, whatever. Yeah. It is ridiculous, though. It is so surreal and ridiculous. Um, I think we do need some levity. I appreciate what you're pointing out there, Matt, because kidnappers have made use of this drug, like drugging parents and abducting their children. Yeah. Sexual predators use this extensively. Um, it's just incredibly difficult to, similar to GHB or roofies, right? It's mm -hmm. difficult to track down a criminal when the victim may have almost no memory of the crime. And as you listen right now, wherever you are in this wide world, these crimes are continuing. And I think we could say it. Each of these is a conspiracy all their own. Yes, a lot of these substances, again, do have legit medical uses. Like uh, scopolamine can treat motion sickness. But it's usually used these days as a weapon. Yikes. And you know what? Uh, scopolamine is terrifying. Uh, just I love that we focused on that. There are other things, Ben, 
mm. in here that we haven't even gotten to yet. And I feel right. like that's always the case. Yeah. We just need to have a 24 hour feed where we just have a conversation and it doesn't stop. <laughs> and we just keep talking That'll through be things. So great for our friendship. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, and our families. <laughs> and uh, our but, families. Yeah. <laughs> but these things that are often called riot control agents nowadays, also known as non lethal chemical weapons, yeah. these substances that are often found through, you know, um, what do they call it? Pharmacological research or. A drug research that is not weaponized, is not meant to be weaponized, but you find out about these substances, then you imagine from a military perspective increasing the dosage on these things and then deploying them in either, as the name states, in a riot situation, right? Yeah. To either yeah. calm down a populace or a bunch of people that are angry, probably for good reason, or to uh, use against an attacking military or to, you know, the way a chemical agent like a nerve gas would have been used back in the day. But in this case, it would be, quote, non-lethal. So maybe it would skirt underneath some of those chemical uh, weapons control treaties and um, the convention, yeah. convention that we have. Mm -hmm. So like and, and there is research on that. But just to go back to that article we cited before, drugs as chemical weapons passed in perspectives. Uh, this this sentence, I think, is the most important thing for our show. Hmm. Research and production on new chemical warfare agents, or CWAs, has virtually stopped. Or it's being conducted secretly. Which I think, because no country is going to come out and say, oh, we are making great advances in our chemical weapons department <laughs> of whatever. Right. And furthermore, no country is going to accept without extensive proof that other countries are somehow keeping their word, right? Oh, yeah. Why would you? But again, and they probably aren't. Uh, it's, it's very similar to some of the pathogen research that we've talked about since 2019 extensively, where there's gain-of-function research happening across the world to make sure that each individual country, sometimes science at large, but mostly individual countries, can defend against any possible uh, release of a pathogen within their populace, right? And how much defensive research can you do before you are making uh, the offensive materials? Yes, but in this case, just with drugs, but, but medicines, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, it, it, it's a hell of a loophole because it's nigh impossible to close it, right? Yeah. Until every substance has been discovered in all of its various forms. It, it's just, it's not going to happen. And a lot of that, look, a lot of that research, uh, the defensive research is legitimate. We're just saying that the line between defensive and offensive is much less bright. There's, there's a lot of liminal gray overlap, the closer you look and it's, it's dangerous. Um, basically what we're saying is the same stuff we say every time here, uh, when we talk about these kind of grifts, micro and macro level, be careful when you're out having fun. You sim we simply cannot assume that every single stranger we meet or every country we encounter is going to be acting in good faith. That was depressing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think most of this is, but, you know, it, that's just kind of. It's kind of the, our trade, Ben. That's what we do. <laughs> we find oh, the, the silver lining. Weed. Yeah, Jimson <laughs> Weed finds that silver lining. Oh, you boys looking for some Datura? That's the name. That's the name of his dog, Silver. It's for, <laughs> for the silver lining. There we go. <laughs> Jimson Weed and Silver Lining. Uh, that's the new show. Please tune in. Uh, tell us if we should make that show. Give us some background on Jimson Weed and Silver Lining. In the meantime. Perhaps even more importantly, uh, we hope that this finds everyone safe amid grand adventure. Uh, we will be back later uh, with a Sirhan Sirhan episode. We've got more on supplements coming out. We've got a lot of work to do, and we'd love for you to be part of our continuing mission. Let us know what you think. Give us your firsthand personal experiences. Always give us suggestions for episodes we should cover in the future. Uh, we try to be easy to find online. You've heard it all before. We, you know, folks, we hope you're not tired of the George Washington stuff. Matt redid the song. We've got a continuing saga, saga, 
Saga. You can find that on Instagram. Uh, if you want to talk with us directly, why not give us a phone call? Our number is one eight three three S T D W Y T K. When you call in, give yourself three minutes because that's how long you've got to make the message. Give yourself a cool nickname, whatever you want, anything, literally anything. Just make it fun. And then uh, let us know at some point in that three minutes if we can use your name and message on the air. And then include your voice, by the way. So, like, if you want us to do something with your voice, let us know. Or if you mm-hmm. don't want us to use your voice, uh, let us know. Or if you, yeah, if you want us just to summarize what you yes. said. For We're totally fine with that. of anonymity. Yeah, we've got your back. Absolutely. Uh, if you don't want to do that, if you've got maybe an attachment, a picture of your cat, as many people have been sending us recently. Thank you. <laughs> we love those. Um, or, you know, a bunch of links. Why not instead send us a good old-fashioned email? We are conspiracy at iheartradio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.